All right, so um, let's continue to talk about differential equations. And this will be lecture 10, right? 11? 11. Lecture 11. All right. So we talked about three kinds of first order differential equations that we can solve so far. One, when it's separable. Uh, well, that makes the differential equation very easy to solve. Um, but very rarely we'll get a case when the equation is separable. Then we talked about when the equation is exact. In the case of an equation being exact, then uh, we just find, uh, we have to test the fact that it's exact. And if we find it to be exact, then we go to the solution procedure, which I explained last time. And then the third case is when we can find an integrating factor to make it exact. So we don't find that it's exact, but it's, uh, it just happens that sometimes we are able to construct an integrating factor, which is just a function that we multiply through by the equation, and it makes it exact. All right? And we, we mentioned that in some cases, it is possible to find an integrating factor of a single variable, either t or y. And if we do find it, then uh, that, uh, that solves the problem. But that's also restricted. It's not a general solution method. So let me give you an example. Given the following uh, first order ODE, we got 2 sine of y squared dt plus ty cosine of y squared dy. And notice that this equation is already written <coughs> in the form where this is p of t and y, and this is q of t and y. Okay? Obviously, we can rewrite, if we wanted to, we can rewrite that equation in the form dy dt equals to f of y and t. And you can see clearly that f of y and t will be um, essentially 2 sine or minus 2 sine w of y squared divided by ty of the cosine of y squared. So this, this uh, you can just separate and write it in that form. Now, it is uh, not a separable equation. It's obviously a first order equation. The highest differential is the first derivative. It is a nonlinear equation. Notice that the y is not only square, but it's inside a sine and a cosine. <coughs> okay, so that makes it highly nonlinear. Um, and uh, so that when it's nonlinear, we it's no, there's no point on discussing whether it's homogeneous or or not, or whether it's constant coefficient or not. It makes no sense. No, it's, it has no relevance. So um, what we do is try to see whether this equation is separable. And as you can see, uh, there is no way that we can pull all the y's to, or can we? Yeah, we actually can. So this is a bad example. <laughs> so we can send everything to the left and put the t's on one side and pull the, put all the y's on the other. So this equation is actually separable. So it's a bad example, but it's an, an example, at least for the point of, uh, of explaining what integrating factors are about. I can show you that. We're going to check if equation is exact. So we're going to take dp dy, which is d dy of twice the sine of y squared. And that will be what? This will be twice the cosine of y squared times the internal derivative, which is 2y. And that would be 4y squared <coughs> times the cosine of y squared. And then we can take the q dt. That will be the derivative with respect to t of ty times the cosine of y squared. And that's just simply y cosine of y squared. And as you can see, this and these are not equal to each other. 
Okay, so that equation is not exact. All right, so we have the P dy not equal to the Q dt, and therefore O D E is not exact. So try an integrating factor. of the form that we derived before, and that would be, well, let's try one that's a function of t only, and that would be e to the integral of one over q times dp dy minus dq dt dt, okay? And it's, it, if we find an integrating factor that happens to end up being just a function of t, then that would be a function that would make that equation exact. But that's the challenge to find one that after you do this, is just a function of t. This expression was found after we made the assumption that the resulting integrating factor would be a function of t only, that y would not be there. All right, so the integrand there is one over q, dp dy minus <coughs> dt. dt. And then that would be um, 1 over q, which is uh, ty cosine of y squared. And dp dy minus dq dt, dp dy is 4y cosine of y squared. And dq dt is um, y cosine of y squared. So as you can see, all the y's go away in this expression. So therefore, 1 over q dp dy minus dq dt and some be, it ends up being 3 over t. So just a function of t. All right, but that's not the integrating factor, that's the integrand of this expression right here, but it just happens to be just a function of t, so the resulting integrating factor is going to be just a function of t. So f of t is equal to e to the integral of 3 over t dt. Okay? So this is equal to What's the integral of 3 over t? What's the integral of 1 over t? dt over t? Huh? The log of t? Come on. I remember that. All right, so, um, so um, it's convenient then to use the properties of logarithm to take this 3 to the power of the argument there, log of t cubed. And then what is the <coughs> exponential function of the logarithm of something? something. That's something. So that's t cubed. All right, so this is a valid integrating factor because it's just a function of t. And that's how we express it. We, we could have assumed from the beginning, too, that, f of, that the integrating factor would be just a function of y and go through the same process and find a similar expression for the integrating factor. But if at the end we don't find that such a <coughs> function, then it's not valid. So what we do is we rewrite the equation multiply ODE by f of t. So that would give us um, 2 sine of y squared times t cubed dt plus t y cosine y squared t 
PQ times dy is equal to zero. So that will give us a new P of T and Y and a new Q of T and Y. This equation is an analogous to the first one because all we did was multiply it through another function. So the solution to this equation is a solution to the original equation provided here. All we did was multiply through. So let's try again. dp dy, which is equal to d dy of twice tq sine of y squared is equal to twice tq cosine of y squared times 2y, which is equal to 4y t cubed cosine of y squared. And the q dt, which is equal to d dt of, this will be t to the fourth times y times the cosine of y squared is equal to, well, that would be 4t cubed times y cosine of y squared. So as you can see, dp dy is equal to the q dt. So this equation is exact. And since it's exact, now we can attempt to solve it. Solving will entail finding u, u of um, y and t is equal to the integral of uh, p of t and y with respect to t is equal to the integral of twice t cubed sine of y squared dt, which is equal to the integral of this with respect to t. This will be t to the fourth over four, so that would be t to the four <coughs> over two sine of y squared plus uh, a function of function of y. And simultaneously, this is a solution. U of, U of y and t is the integral of q of t and y dy, which is the integral of q, which is um, t to the fourth y cosine of y squared dy. Right? So now we have to integrate the cosine of y squared, which locally has a y next to it because it needs the internal derivative or the derivative of the argument, but the derivative of y squared is 2y. So we need a 2 here and a 1 half. We need to pre-multiply by 1 half, multiply by 2. So now we have the u times the cosine of u, or u prime times the cosine of u. So that would lead to t to the power of 4 times the 1 half that we pre-multiply times the sine of y squared, which is the integral of the cosine, plus g of t. Right? And as you can see, this one and this one are equal to each other. As you can see, fy doesn't show up here, so this one has to be zero, and this one doesn't show up there, so this one has to be <coughs> zero. So, the solution of the ODE is given by u of y and t is equal to a constant. And therefore, that would mean that t to the fourth divided by 2 times the sine of y squared 
is equal to a constant? Well, that is the answer. That is the general implicit solution. Can we attempt to make it explicit? Can we solve for the y? It looks like it. We can say that uh, the sine of y squared is equal to 2c divided by t to the fourth, and therefore y squared is equal to um, the arc sine of 2c times t to the fourth, and then therefore y of t is equal to plus minus the square root of the arc sine or sine to the minus one, whichever way you want to write the arc sine. And this is the general <coughs> explicit <coughs> solution. You can test it, you can verify that this is indeed the answer to the original, or the solution to the original equation. The original equation B being this one. You can plug it in there and find out what it is. <coughs> and we would use plus initial condition such that y of zero is equal to some y zero, some given value y zero, will lead to the particular solution. Which in this case can actually be particular solutions. It can be more than one because the equation is nonlinear and therefore it is allowed to have more than one particular solution. More than one solution that satisfies the equation and it satisfies the initial condition. All right. So, let's concentrate on linear equations. First order. Linear ODEs. If we have a first order linear ODE given the ODE written as rather than this form dy dt plus some p of t times y of t <coughs> is equal to r of t. All right, so that's clearly a linear equation. We have first derivative, zero derivative. They're not multiplying each other. They're not square. They're not part of, they're not an argument of a, a rational or irrational function or transcendental function. It has variable coefficients, if p is a function of t, that's a variable coefficient. If r of t is different than zero, it'd be, the equation is non-homogeneous. So this is a um, first order linear variable coefficient unless p of t is equal to a constant, homogeneous, unless r of t is equal to zero, ordinary differential equation. Huh? Non-homogeneous? You're right. Non-homogeneous, unless r of t is equal to zero. Okay, so these ODE always as a solution.
solution. So we're guaranteed to find a solution, and that solution is guaranteed to be unique. And that solution can be found, or is given in terms of an integrating of an integrating factor f of t. So we are guaranteed to find an integrating factor that is just a function of t that will make this equation exact. And the solution, the particular solution, <coughs> y of t is unique. Okay, we can find that solution by applying this integrating factor. So let's rewrite this equation. We can rewrite this equation as p of t times y minus r of t times um, dt plus dy is equal to zero. So that same equation can be rewritten, rewritten in that form. So now it's in the form where we can identify p of y and t, and we can identify q of y and t. All right? It is not guaranteed to be exact. The fact that it's linear doesn't mean that it's exact. But we can make it exact by multiplying it through find f of t and multiply ODE f of t, p of t, y minus r t dt plus f of t dy is equal to zero. <coughs> Such that it becomes exact. Same procedure that we just practiced. Now, this integrating factor, f of t, is going to be equal to, remember, e to the integral of 1 over q times dp dy minus dq dt dt. Right? So who is such that dp dy? Who is dp dy? The partial derivative of p with respect to y is just simply this given function lowercase p of t, right? Is that clear? And dq dt is what? How much is q? 1. So the q dt is 0. Right? So f of t is simply e to the integral of p of t dt. The general <coughs> integrating factor for first order linear ODEs. So anytime you're given an equation of this form, this is the integrating factor. This linear equation is not guaranteed to be exact. In fact, it's never exact. <coughs> but you can make it exact by finding an integrating factor that happens to always be this. All right? 
So now, what we're going to do is pre-multiply the equation, or multiply the ODE by this. Therefore, the ODE becomes e to the integral of p of t dt times p of t times y minus r of t dt times or plus e to the integral of p of t dt times dy is equal to zero. <coughs> and we can rewrite it again and find that this is e to the integral of p of t dt times dy dt plus p of t times uh, y is equal to e to the integral p of t, dt, times r of t. So it's just the way we originally wrote the equation. <coughs> it goes back to that. All right. So we can take We can uh, rewrite this by applying chain rule backwards as d dt of y of t times e to the integral of p of t dt. And that's equal to the right hand side, which happens to be the integral of p of t. So this left-hand side is the same as this left-hand side. If we expand the left-hand side by applying chain rule, we'll get this. All right, and then we can take d times y of t e to the integral of p of t dt is equal to e times the integral of p of t dt, r of t dt. Notice that the right hand side is just the function of t. And now we can integrate on both sides. And we'll get y of t times e to the integral of p of t dt is equal to the integral of e to the integral of p of t dt, r of t dt, plus a constant of integration. So, Finally, y of t, which is the solution to the equation we're looking for, is 1 over e to the integral of p of t dt times the integral of e to the integral of p of t dt, r of t dt plus c. And this always works. <coughs> So if the equation happens to be linear, we can always find an answer like that. So this is the general solution for any, for any first order linear. It has to be linear, ODE. In 
Implicit into that is an integrating factor, which happens to be e to the integral of p of t dt. But we already wrote it in and found the solution. So, if I give you dy dt plus the tangent of t times y of t is equal to the sine of 2t with initial condition y of 0 is equal to 1, <coughs> find particular solution. So given that differential equation, which happens to be linear in first order, then let's find the particular solution. So if we Write the equation this is P of T and this is R of T so the integrating factor f of t is equal, remember, to the integral, to e to the integral of p of t dt, which is equal to e to the integral of the tangent of t dt. Remember what the integral of the tangent is? It's not one of the trivial ones. You have to say that this is the integral of the sine of the cosine. And so it's an integral of u prime over u, right? So it's the log of u. So it's the log of the cosine, and it's actually log of the negative of the cosine, which happens to be the, the secant. So f of t is equal to e times the log of the secant of t. And then because the exponential function of the log of something is just something, this will be the secant of t. <coughs> All right. So, the solution, general solution, happens to be y of t is equal to 1 over f of t times the integral of f of t times rt dt plus a constant of integration. So y of t is equal to 1 over the secant of t, which is the cosine, times the integral of the secant of t times r of t, which is the sine of 2t, dt plus c. Right? So you can ask Maple or Mathcat to solve that, but let's just do it by hand for the sake of completion here. Um, I will take the sine of 2t and make it twice the sine of t times the cosine of t. That comes from the identity of the double angle, which comes from the identity of the summation of two angles. <coughs> and remember that uh, 1 over the secant of t happens to be the cosine.
Okay? So, y of t is equal to the cosine of t times the integral of the secant of t, which is 1 over the cosine of t, times the sine of 2t, which happen, happens to be twice the sine of t, cosine of t, dt plus c. Cosine and cosine go away. So y of t is equal to the integral of which the sine is the negative cosine, and then we have a 2. So this will be minus 2 times the cosine square of t. plus c times the cosine of t. Right? <coughs> so this is the general solution. This solves the equation. It doesn't satisfy the initial condition, but it is guaranteed that that function right there satisfies that equation. We can test it, take the y dt, take y, multiply it the sine, that should be equal to the sine of 2t. All right, so now we need to apply the initial condition. says that y of 0 is equal to 1, that would mean that minus 2 times the cosine square of 0 plus c times the cosine of 0 is equal to 1. Remember what the cosine of 0 is? 1. So the cosine <coughs> square of 1 is 1. And therefore, this is minus 2 plus c is equal to 1, and therefore c is equal to 3. So y of t is equal to 3 cosine of t minus twice the cosine square of t. And this is the particular solution. The right way of saying it is the particular solution. There's only one of it. And uh, it satisfies both the differential equation and the initial condition. At time equals zero, you can see that this gives you one, which is a provided initial condition. All right. We have a general methodology that guarantees a solution as long as the equation is first order and linear. Okay? It can be homogeneous or non-homogeneous, it can be variable coefficient or, or not, it doesn't matter. It is always guaranteed to get a solution. And that solution, the particular one, is unique. Okay? Now, in general, Nonlinear first order ODEs <coughs> are not guaranteed to yield a solution. And if a solution 
illusion exists, it may not be unique. It is not guaranteed that it's unique. So, how do we deal with these? There is no general solution approach to nonlinear ODEs, first orders, if they are not separable, exact, or if a single variable integrating factor is not available. Okay? So if the equation is separable, exact, or if an integrating factor is available, then <coughs> we can solve it as we showed. But in general, there is no solution method. So what do we do? Huh? We give up? In general? Attempt a numerical approximation approach. All right, so what do we do? If we're given an ODE, dy dt is equal to f of y and t. That's just a first order ODE, first order ODE. And such that y of 0 is equal to some given value y0. That's why I use that hat in the initial condition. So we call this this initial value problem. Again, that equation is just a first order ODE. We don't know if it's linear. We don't know if it's exact. We don't know if it's separable. We don't know if it can actually be made exact. It's just a general equation. So we're going to attempt to approximate it. Approximate the solution. Now instead of trying to find, instead of trying to find an algebraic expression for y of t, Try a discrete, there's no a discrete, a discrete distribution of y i at t i such that i is equal to zero to some n pi. So attempt a discrete distribution, a discrete solution. So, where do we start? We're going to try to expand y of t in a Taylor series about time tn. I'm going to call this Tn. Okay, so we don't know what y is, but we know that Taylor series approximations is just an infinite polynomial that applies to any function. And it has a radius of convergency about the point at which you're expanding it. So we can say that y of t 
is equal to y evaluated at tn, that's the point of expansion. y of t is the general function that we're trying to find. And tn is just the point in time that we pick to expand this function from or about. And that's equal to dy dt, or this plus dy dt evaluated at tn times d minus tn plus the second derivative of y times dt or, or of dt squared evaluated at tn times t minus tn squared divided by 2 factorial and we can continue plus d cube y dt cube evaluated at tn times t minus tn squared sorry cube divided by 3 factorial plus as many as what we want to do the k derivative of y divided by dt to the k, evaluated at tn, t minus tn to the power of k, divided by k factorial. Such that k goes to infinity. So a Taylor series is an infinite polynomial series. Okay? These are polynomial terms. This is polynomial of first order, of second order, of third order, k order. These are polynomials of t. So we can actually, Taylor says, that we can take any function we want, any function we want, and expand it in terms of polynomials, and we'll get an exact representation of the function as long as the polynomial goes to infinity. Okay? That's a Taylor series. So what good does it do? Well, if we assume, assuming that t minus tn is small, if we assume that we are going to evaluate the resulting polynomial at a value of t that is very close to the point of expansion, that's what we selected, that point of expansion, then we can truncate the series after the second term because t minus tn to the power of k is very, very small. It's very small. If t minus tn is a small number, then t minus tn to the power of anything greater than 2 or greater or equal than 2, then it's very small. So now we can say that y of t is approximately y about the point or evaluated at the point of expansion plus the first derivative of y with respect to t evaluated at the point of expansion times t minus tn. Plus an error, and this because there is a truncation, of the order of t minus tn to the power of 2. Because the larger number of the truncation, this number is smaller than this, and so on and so forth. So the larger number, or the larger term of the truncation is of the order of t minus tn. Remember that the second derivative of y with respect to t squared evaluated at tn is just a number. They're evaluated at the point of expansion tn. So, we can solve for dy dt, dy dt evaluated at tn is equal to, or approximately equal to, y of t minus y at tn divided by t minus tn plus an error now of the order of t minus tn. So we divided everything by t minus tn. Now we're assuming that this is true. We're able to truncate that infinite series because t minus tn is small. 
because we're evaluating the polynomial at, at a value of time that is really close to the point of expansion. So let's let t be equal to tn plus 1. <coughs> okay, so if the point of expansion is tn, let's call t some tn plus 1, some point in time that is really close to t, so that tn plus 1 minus tn is equal to delta t. And this is the time step. So, basically, what happens now is that dy <coughs> dt at tn is equal to, or it's approximately equal to, y at tn plus 1 minus y at tn divided by delta t plus an error that's of the order of magnitude of delta t. or dy dt at n is approximately y at n plus 1 minus y at n divided by delta t plus an error in the truncation of the order delta t. And that's where it comes from. We already knew that answer. We already knew that dy dt could be approximated as y at n plus 1 minus y at n divided by delta t. That's just a discrete first order approximation of the first derivative. Okay, so this is called the first order. And it's called first order not because it's the approximation of the first derivative, it's called first order because the truncation error is the first order. <coughs> first order means order delta t, as opposed to order delta t squared or order delta t cubed. And this truncation error and this approximation is, is a finite difference approximation of the first derivative. First All right, so what do we do with these? Now we know how to discreetly approximate the derivative. We can go back to the ODE, back to the ODE, which remember was dy dt of t is equal to f of t of a t. Evaluate ODE at time equals Tn, at some discrete point in time. So dy dt at Tn is equal to f, I'm sorry, this is y, f of yn comma Tn. Remember that the function f is given as part of the differential equation that is predefined. That is what we're trying to solve. We're trying to solve a differential equation which might be nonlinear, it might be non-exact, non-solvable, of the form dy dt is equal to f, but the f is given. It's just a function of y and t. So using use uh, finite difference. Approximation of dy dn, or sorry, dy dt at tn, and that leads to by n plus 1 <laughs> minus yn divided by delta t is approximately f 
of yn comma tn. And therefore, yn plus 1 is approximately yn plus delta t times f of yn comma tn. And this was the first attempt at numerically solving initial value problems. This is called the Euler's method. And it dates back to the time of Euler. Way before computers were invented, they attempted to approximate the solutions of differential equations by doing this by hand, evaluating discreetly in time. And this is called a first order, and it's called first order because it's order delta t. Approximation method or first order ODEs, or first order initial value problem. And it's extremely simple. As you can see, the implementation of these is an extremely simple algorithm. So you start at t0 equals 0, where you know the solution, because you know the initial condition, where y zero is equal to the given initial condition. And advance in time to a final value steps. in order to arrive at the solution. So the result is a discrete collection of values yn <coughs> at tn such that n goes from 0 some final time. So at the end of the day, we solve the equation without solving the equation, without coming up or arriving at an algebraic expression for the solution. We just arrive at the collection of values. Now this method, these approximation method is order delta t accurate. What does it mean? That the error is the size of delta t? No, if we knew that the error was the size of delta t, if we know the error, we know the exact solution, right? But the reason why we're attempting this is because we don't know the exact solution. But we know the order of magnitude of the error, and we know that the order of magnitude of the error is proportional to delta t, which just means that if we use a delta t that's half the size, the error of the approximation should be half the size, so it's proportional. So it's linearly proportional to delta t. The error in the approximation is linearly proportional, proportional to delta t. This means that if delta t is half, then the error is half. The error in the approximation. Let's look at 
coming up with a method that is a little bit more accurate than this. This is just simply over delta t accurate. We need to derive a high order, a higher order method. So the logical approach would be to go back to that infinite Taylor series, and instead of truncating after the second term, let's truncate after the third term. Okay, let's just keep the straight. So what we do is go back to the Taylor series and truncate. After the third term. So that would be y at n plus 1 is approximately y at n plus dy dt at n times delta t plus the second derivative of y with respect to t squared at n times delta t squared over 2 plus an error in the approximation of the order of delta t cubed. This is a truncation. Now back to ODE, the ODE we're trying to solve looks like dy dt is equal to f of y and t. And in this expression, we not only need dy dt, we need the second derivative of y with respect to t. Therefore, the second derivative of y with respect to t squared is equal to the derivative of f with respect to t, right? But notice f is a function of two variables, and we're trying to take a total derivative of that function with respect to t. So that would be what? Remember from chain rule? We take the total derivative of a function of two variables, we'll get uh, the partial of f of y and t with respect to t times dt over dt, this is the dt in the denominator, plus the partial of f of y and t with respect to y times dy dt. Okay, so the Total differential of the F by chain rule is this. Okay? And I'm just dividing by dt. <coughs> the second derivative of y with respect to t squared is therefore simply df dt of y and t plus df dy of y and t times dy dt. And dy dt is f of y and t, right, from the given of the So plug this into truncated Taylor series. And what we end up with is y of n plus 1 is approximately y of n plus dy dn. I'm going to look back at the Taylor series. dy dn or dy dt at n, that would be delta t 
times f of yn tn plus delta t squared over 2 times df dt of yn tn plus df dy of yn tn times f of yn And everything on the right hand side is known because it's at the previous time step or at the previous time value. We know f, and hence we know the fdy, and hence we know the fdt, and we can evaluate those functions at the previous time level, tn, where we know the solution yn, because if we start from <coughs> time equals zero, we know the initial condition. So this is. the Euler's second order, that would be order delta t squared, approximation method for first order ODEs. Again, start at t0 equals 0, where you know the solution y0 equal a given y0. So basically, you're starting at n equals 0. And advanced in time. N equals zero to some final time nf that you decide what it's going to be. You decide when to stop. So this method is said to be second order accurate. This method is second order or order delta t square accurate, which means that if the time step delta t is half, the error in the approximation is expected to be reduced by a quarter. To a quarter. So this means that the error decays faster with size of delta t. Okay, so this is uh, Euler's methods. And again, these two methodologies, or these two schemes, date back to the time of Euler when there was no computer. So this is just given a differential equation, evaluated by hand, advance in time, discretize the time, and see if you can actually get to the solution. So next class, we'll define a couple more problems, a couple more schemes, and then we'll put them to practice right away. We'll write a little code in class and show that they actually match the analytical solution. We'll try for a, for a problem where we know the analytical solution, obviously, so we can verify it's, it's accurate. All right, are there any questions? So I'll see you on Tuesday. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.